Hello and welcome to episode 50 of Off the Bandstand live here at Monk's Jazz on the beautiful east side of Austin, Texas. My name is Christian Wiggs. I am your host. Today's performance, tonight's performance and guest is John Mills featuring his band John Mills Times 10, an ensemble that features exclusively compositions and arrangements from John Mills. Uh, if you don't know John, he is a brilliant saxophonist and international award-winning composer and arranger. John serves as the professor of jazz studies at the University of Texas at Austin. He has presented master classes at institutions and, if you have a pin ready, write them all down, Denmark, Russia, Germany, Chile, Guatemala, Slovenia, and Italy. And in 2019, he was inducted into the Austin Jazz Society Hall of Fame and has served as the musical director for the 2020 Grammy-nominated Best Contemporary Blues Album Live at the Paramount by the Ruth Foster Big Band. If you can say all of that in one breath, I owe you a beer. Uh, so we are going to move on to uh, the release of the week, which is John Mills' most recent recording with uh, John Mills Times 10, which is called Flying Blind, released in 2017. And we are going to get into a whole lot of history of John's 50 years in Austin, Texas, and in the scene and everywhere else that he has been flown out to. But for now, let's dive into tonight's performance performance and episode. This is Off the Bandstand. <laughs>
ladies and gentlemen, welcome into now. Uh, well, this isn't my apartment uh, anymore. Off the Bandstand was born out of this idea of wanting to keep the jazz scene cohesive in tandem with Colin Shook, which is why we've always been. Uh, yeah, this guy, can we have a hand for Colin Shook over here? Owner, curator, all things jazz here in Austin. But it was meant as a, as a way of, of connecting all of us, even though we had to be apart. You know, I'm not going to talk about the pandemic because we're all here now and we, uh, we are glad to be on the other side of this thing. But it was just this beautiful, you know, uh, uh, opportunity once a week to sit down with some of the best jazz musicians, not only here in the Austin area, but it quickly exploded uh, through a lot of the people here in town, uh, like having Carmen Bradford, uh, one of the last vocalists with the Count Basie Orchestra, in the very first few episodes, largely in part to do with uh, her ties here in the Austin scene. So I'm going to stop talking about the uh, prelude to this evening and welcome my guest, John Mills. Thank you so much for doing this, and congratulations on 50 years in Austin. Yeah, I guess that's good news. <laughs> it is good news. 50 years. That's, that sounds scary to me, but I'm afraid it's true. <laughs> well, uh, it's, it's really just, uh, it all worked out. All the stars aligned to have the 50th episode and you as Your the, 50th the 50th show, that's fantastic. Yeah, this is very, very fun. So, uh, you know, it might seem like, and also I should say, congratulations on not only bringing the band back for one night, but the kind of famed Triple Crown tour of Elephant Room last night, Monks tonight, and Parker tomorrow evening. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're accustomed to, uh, even in the best of times, playing once a month. So three nights in a row, we don't know how to act, you know, so sure. we're out of control. Well, I'm sure we'll have Michael Mordecai keep us in check if we, uh, <laughs> if we start going off the rails. Yeah. Uh, well, this might seem like an obvious question, but everyone loves a good origin story. So where did you come up, and how did that end up bringing you over here to the Austin scene? Well, I grew up in Houston, where there was a lot of uh, jazz. I mean, some jazz stars living in Houston. There's a great jazz club in Houston, but a very uh, strong jazz education system in the, a particular school I was at in uh, Houston. And I came to Austin because I knew I had heard the University of Texas jazz band visit my high school on a recruiting trip. In fact, Mike Mordecai was in that band, although I didn't know Mike yet. But that proved to me, ah, there's a place I could go where I know I'll keep, be able to keep playing jazz. And uh, so that's, that's what brought me to Austin. Like so many people, the University of Texas had something to do with it to, for getting here. And then the music scene was a reason for staying forever. <laughs> sure, yeah. So, uh, you know, without being too incriminating, when you first arrived on the scene, was there some sort of immediate allure? Or was it kind of like, all right, things are happening. Maybe we got our work cut out from us, for us. Or was it just off to the races immediately? Well, everybody was playing from day one, and I don't think anybody was really thinking about careers in music. I certainly wasn't. But from the very first day, there were jam sessions going on of all kinds, you know, not strictly jazz, singer-songwriter kind of jam sessions. Uh, a lot of us got our starts. You know, I was probably here for two weeks as a freshman, and I started playing gigs with the Nash Hernandez Orchestra, which many of my predecessors, again, Mike included, seeing him nodded, like our first professional gigs in Austin where we were reading a combination of big band gigs and then cumbias and things like that. So that was like where a lot of us started. And there was, uh, Austin always had a kind of an identity with a lot of really creative bands that didn't really fit in the mold exactly. <laughs> and uh, there's just a lot going on. And I can say it was as far away from the music industry at that time as you could imagine, but there was a lot of energy. Some you know, key people around, some of whom are still around the Austin area who really uh, energized it, yeah. yeah. I got a quick question for you. How different was Sixth Street back in, in the late 70s? Well, there was there was essentially one business that was open on 6th Street after 5 p.m. You know, there was like a, a club, like the first location of Antones and then a little later Steamboat. But 6th Street did not exist as we think of 6th Street now. In fact, it was not until the 80s. I remember playing down there one night when some, you know, we were close, you know, closing up, getting paid or whatever, leaving the, cl the club at like 2 a.m. And the guy says, step outside, you're not gonna believe this. 
and we looked outside, and there were swarms of people <laughs> everywhere after 2 a.m. And never, it, so it happened essentially overnight. Yeah. I guess that was early 80s, maybe, that that happened. Signs and wonders. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I have a question for you is that, you know, I had read that you have uh, recorded on over 200 albums. 200 albums. That's amazing. And appeared on nine episodes of Austin City Limits PBS specials. Uh, were there any of those uh, Austin City Limits specials that really stand out to you as some notable ones? Well, one very uh, opportunity I got that I was by no means ready for in term musically, but I got the, ch the invitation to perform on a uh, PBS, on an Austin City Limits special, Ray Benson and Friends Swinging Over the Rainbow um, uh, with Willie Nelson. So that was probably the first ACL show I got on by, I don't know how, but I got on there. How, how old were you whenever that happened? Oh, maybe 23, something like that. All right, well... For those of us who are above 23 and those of us <laughs> approaching 23, take notes. We, we have some work to do uh, to get to that same kind yeah. of stature. And then another thing is that I also understand that, uh, you know, you've written a lot of jingles, a lot of different things for uh, different commercials like uh, Chevrolet and uh, also Specs Liquor. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, the, part of the beauty of writing jingles is you get paid and nobody knows you wrote it. So that's, <laughs> that's, 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 a, that's a win win situation right there. Well, I was going to say with specs, you know, instead of an invoice, you could almost just send them a grocery list and call it good, you know, <laughs> after you submit it. Anyway, yeah, so if uh, I just as soon get the dollars than the wares, that, that's, that's, that's just me. But uh, anyway, writing jingles is great. You get to work with a bunch of great players who are, you know, this, essentially the same people I call for my favorite jazz gig, you know, because the same kind of challenges guys who hear something presented to them and, you know, 60 seconds later, they're laying down the version that's going to be on the radio forever. Yeah, for sure. Well, you know, I went down the rabbit hole of checking out all of those different Specs commercials last night at about <laughs> 3 a.m. because I definitely, once I found out that piece of information, I had to find them. And uh, one thing that I will say is, uh, you know, just a testament to John's writing is that uh, there were four comments. Uh, there was the most amount of comments on one of them from 2017, and it was a YouTube comment that said, my one-year-old loves this song. She bounces to it. So not only is he teaching at the collegiate level, it's also at the infant level as well. I think the secret sauce on that is we had a double set of hand claps. Okay. Kirk, were you involved in that double set of hand claps we did on the Specs Jungle? I don't wow. remember. Yeah, <laughs> that, that is the magic ingredient that we came up with at the last second. Fantastic. Well, I'm glad that Specs is doing their part to make Austin a little <laughs> bit more hip. Uh, what do you have next for us, John? Well, we're going to do, uh, we've got so many great players in this band. I want to, part of the reason I can lure them to these things is I get everybody a chance to stretch out. So we're going to do a couple songs where you'll hear, not from everybody yet, but some of our other great soloists uh, this First one coming up is one that I think that caught your ear. It's called Half Past Sunday. It's going to feature Jake Lampa on the alto sax, as well as Russ Scanlon, who has rejoined us all the way from Santa Fe, his new home. Uh, yeah. Russ, let's hear it for Russ. Let's hear it for Santa Fe. So anyway, that's what we're going to do next. Half, half Past Sunday, and then whatever comes after that, I think uh, a, a deep, dark, mysterious, complex number called Sombras y Luz, where you'll hear from a couple other of our great players. Fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, John Mills.
Okay, for now for something scary. Yeah. Thank you. 
There is not a single soul that can watch this live stream and deny what we have here in Austin, Texas. That is just unbelievable. Man, uh, you know, I want to make sure to take a, a moment here and thank uh, Tito's Vodka uh, for this evening. They're not a sponsor. We're just trying to get them to be, trying to build some social clout. <laughs> At this rate, we might as well say Circuit City, you know? It's, it's all the same. Uh, well, John, you know, uh, you've no doubt been able to collaborate with uh, just some absolutely luminary musicians over the course of your career, and it's at this point where I have to reference the cue cards because the list is long. Uh, it's really a sampler plate for everybody, no matter what your flavor is. Uh, we have jazz musicians such as Steve Swallow, Carla Blay, Maria Schneider, our very own Butch Miles, who is in the house tonight. Hey, Butch. To name just a few jazz greats. I don't know if maybe I should preemptively apologize. I didn't tell him I was going to name drop him and say that he was in the audience. But uh, then you also have uh, R&B artists such as Bonnie Raitt and Aretha Franklin, alternative pop artists like David Byrne of Talking Heads. If you don't know either of those names, if you know the tune Psycho Killer, Kes Kese, ba 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 that's David Byrne in Talking Heads. And then Johnny Greenwood of Radiohead, and then the list goes on. Ray Benson in Asleep at the Wheel, Lyle Lovett, Willie Nelson, as you mentioned earlier. Uh, you know, I'm sure all of these have been incredibly notable, but are there some that I missed? Maybe like one that has to do in Zilker Park that might have been an opening that, that was incredibly exciting? Well, yeah, you happen to mention Zilker Park. Uh, I was racing through my uh, index cards to see what I could think of. But yes, I had the opportunity. Uh, one of the groups I play with is a horn section called the Texas Horns. And we had recently played on a, a big record of Los Lonely Boys. And Los Lonely Boys were doing a series of concerts, you know, premiering that material that we played on. And that kind of wound up with uh, the Los Lonely Boys, with us as the horn section in tow, opening for the Rolling Stones at Zilker Park for uh, 50,000 people. Some of you were probably there just by the percentages and the probabilities. But yeah, that was a lot of fun. Um, you know, it goes right along with playing for those big crowds and the famous people. So much of what makes Austin tick is any given night of the week with a bunch of fantastic players, just magical things happen. You know, not always, the cameras aren't always rolling like they are now, but that's where a lot of the great stuff happens and, and always has happened in Austin. These guys up on stage are a big part of all of that kind of thing that happens just every night of the week. So, you know, there, there are those kinds of flashy moments, I guess, that you put in your scrapbook, but there's a lot of just great music night after night. Well, you know, that's something that, uh, you know, uh, the great Adrian Ruiz over here said something to me. I heard a, uh, he kind of was like, oh, no, what's he going to say? Uh, no, but he says, you know, that here in Austin we have an embarrassment of riches. And I, I, I can't think of a more fitting kind of uh, tagline to associate with the Austin, not only the Austin jazz scene, but the Austin scene in general of music. Uh, selfishly, I have to ask, what was the situation with David Byrne? Well, uh, a, a really great friend of mine, a wonderful composer, a wonderful musician named Stephen Barber, had been living in New York for a number of years and, um, you know, just all kinds of great accomplishments. And among other things, he had, was doing some work with David Byrne, and he lured David uh, to do uh, an album here in Austin, recorded in Austin. Uh, it was one called Grown Backwards. And I did some uh, performing on it, of arrangements that Steve wrote, uh, various woodwinds and things, and then I kind of, uh, Steve was generous enough to turn over the uh, driving, uh, the steering wheel to me for kind of a funk, Barry Sachs oriented chart that, that I arranged for David Byrne, and uh, a couple other projects through the graciousness of Stephen Barber, doing some orchestral arrangements for him, and um, you know, I get some other kind of performances. Beautiful. How was he as a, without, again, without incriminating you? Because if he was not a nice guy, you couldn't say it on camera, and it's certainly not on the live stream. But Well, he's, he's a very introspective kind of guy from what I saw. Of course, you, you know, the nature of that sort of encounter is you're not there to be a fan. You're there to do your job, you yeah, know, sure. and take care of the music. Sure. And that's, that's what uh, we were all doing. That's what he was doing. He was listening carefully and 
you know, occasionally making suggestions or comments. And uh, like a lot of those opportunities, those guys who are, and women who are great musicians, uh, that's, that's sort of the subject of it, you know. It's, they're not being the life of the party. They're, they're taking care of their project and thinking about making all those millions of decisions you're making during the recording process. Absolutely. You know, and uh, belated congratulations are in order for your winning of the Sonic Award from the International Society of Jazz Arrangers and Composers uh, for your piece. A, a symposium, for uh, those of you who are unfamiliar, uh, featured this specific year composers Chris Potter, Bill Frizzell, Christine Jensen, and Vince Mendoza, just to name a few. They were the, the stars who brought everybody to the conference. I don't think, uh, <laughs> I would never pretend I was in competition with those guys. <laughs> Uh, so, but uh, they, yeah, they were the the guests at that uh, particular year, and you know, any time you know, a like that, you just put your music out there, and sometimes you get lucky, and that was one of those times. Yeah, well, as I understand it too, this was uh, the specific symposium uh, at the University of Northern Colorado, and Greeley was. One of those situations, kind of tragically, where two opportunities presented themselves and uh, push had to come to shove. So can you enlighten us on that situation? It's pretty much an amplification of what happens for musicians constantly, right? You've got no gigs for a week, and then suddenly two people call you for Tuesday night. You know, it's like, how did that happen? It never quite spaces itself out right. So I had, I had won this honor, and I was going and they made all kinds of plans to go there and attend and direct the band and all that. Uh, and then at the last minute, uh, again, the Texas Horns got the opportunity uh, playing with Jimmy Vaughn, who we often play with, to open for Eric Clapton for three nights at, in London at the Royal Albert Hall. And uh, for about uh, 30 minutes, I was thinking, which one am I going to do? <laughs> and, th and then I thought, well, you you're insane. You've got to go play the gig at Royal Albert Hall, which is what I did. And, you know, it's a beautiful experience. And, you know, it can't be everywhere, everywhere. We all try to be everywhere, two or three places at once. But that was, I actually looked into the possibility of flying back that night from <laughs> London and can I get to Denver and drive to Greece? I mean, I looked into it yeah, seriously yeah, and yeah, it was, yeah, sure. I couldn't come within, uh, uh, you know, six hours even with the best case connections, no delay scenario. It just wasn't going to happen. So, so it was, it was a toss up between compositional royalty and playing for potentially actual royalty at Royal Albert Hall. Yeah. And, uh, I kind of, <laughs> The, given the choice between being sort of honored and just going and playing some music, I like the part where you just go play some music. He's so. a humble guy, and no <laughs> one can fault him for uh, yeah. going to fly yeah. across the pond to go and play yeah. a huge, I mean, the organ in that room alone, I'm not sure if it was utilized, but hey, you know, at least to just look at it had to have been. It, nice. it was spectacular, and uh, we kind of got to sneak around the corner. We probably shouldn't have, to, but to <laughs> yeah. listen to Eric Clapton, and it you know, brought tears to my eyes. Sure. It was so fantastic. Amazing. Well, let's hear some more of the stuff that you win awards to go and play. <laughs> so uh, what do you have next? We've got one that was inspired by our trip to one of those conferences we played in New Orleans, and it was a very a dark and stormy trip, very foggy in January going to New Orleans. Mm. And uh, many of us are, were pretty sure that we saw the swamp thing somewhere <laughs> on the other side of Beaumont somewhere. <laughs> and, uh, and then later that evening, we were in a very fine dining establishment in the quarter, and... Uh, we saw the swamp thing for sure crawling up the wall from the uh, kitchen into the restaurant. <laughs> and uh, we don't have photographic uh, evidence, but we do have this song is what I, that I offer as proof. Just to be sure, Spex was not sponsoring this trip, right? Uh, no, no, there was, there was <laughs> <Yeah>. no, uh, <laughs> no sponsorship, you know, every man for himself. Sure. Absolutely. So this is called Swamp Thing. You will hear from uh, Dr. Adrian Ruiz on trumpet, I do believe, uh, Joey Calarusso once again on the Barry Sax, and you'll get some kind of unpredictable uh, chemistry between Chris Afferbo on the bass and our wonderful guest drummer, Kirk Covington, the one and only Kirk Covington on drums. So this is Swamp Thang. John Mills.
the Swamp Thing. And I'm sure you're going to introduce all these great players just down the line one more time. Joey Calvaruso on the baritone saxophone. Jake Lampa on alto saxophone. Fabulous lead trumpet player, Eric Johnson. On the jazz trumpet chair right behind me, that's Adrian Ruiz. And a uh, very important member of this band, our trombonist, Michael Mordecai, who also does so many of the logistics, makes it all possible, Michael Mordecai on trombone. Mike is somebody that I've been playing with steadily since the 70s. Uh, somebody else in that category on piano, Hank Himsoff. From way, way, way back. The same goes for our guitarist, Russ Scanlon, who I've been playing with about that same length of time. Russ Scanlon. On bass, Chris Afflerbaugh. And the uh, one and only Kirk Covington on drums, a.k.a. Captain Kirk. So uh, we're going to sneak... Uh, how we doing there, Christian? One more song. We got, we're going to do the title cut from this most recent CD. This is called Flying Blind. And one quick thing to mention, uh, because we have not done it yet. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are joining us on the live stream... In this corner right there, all right, it's backwards, we have a Venmo and a PayPal. If you would like to donate to the band, any and all uh, contributions to that are appreciated. Uh, of course, the people who are here live, their patronage is just here in uh, the studio. Uh, of course, you are also allowed to make a charitable donation to the band. Uh, so they can get some Whataburger on the way home. You know, it's like the perfect way to cap a jazz gig. But if you are viewing online, please go over to this link right up here, the Venmo and PayPal. And again, here is Flying Blind. Well, change of plans. Of course, I'd be the one to screw up the order of my charts. We're going to do uh, one from our first CD called Force of Nature, okay? Force of Nature, there it is. <laughs>
John Mills times 10. John Mills on the tennis saxophone. Russ Scanlon on the guitar featured on that last tune. You know, it just occurred to me, I, I do uh, owe somebody uh, uh, a special credit, and it's the person who's been right next to me all along, Hank Himsoth, for teaching me a, uh, an intro to music technology course oh seven years ago, <laughs> without which I don't think I would have been able to do this show. So really, he's the unsung hero of Off the Bandstand. We're going to put his face on the logo. Yeah. This new logo be damned. We're going to do a brand, new, uh, a brand new edit. John, what a, what a pleasure it is to be here. Not bad for a band that last night played the first time in 15 months. Woo. Just last night. So <laughs> I, I think the uh, key is knowing the right people to call, and then everything <laughs> takes care of itself. Absolutely. Well, there is something that I, I have been so excited to talk to you about, uh, specifically because of the fact that it is something that can be recognized on a global scale, not to say that all of the other countless achievements that you have. I mean, you're so humble, you probably wouldn't acknowledge that even if I like lauded you with all the compliments, but something on a national, global scale that people could recognize is a, a project uh, that you finished called Queenie Pie with Jeff Helmer. And, uh, you know, in, a, in addition to all the performing and recording credits that you have that are incredibly, uh, uh, you know, they exceed musicians' wildest dreams, I have to imagine that this project was equally as stressful as it was gratifying because of the large shoes to fill of Duke Ellington. For those of us who don't know what Queenie Pie is, could you fill us in? Yes, uh, Queenie Pie is uh, what Duke Ellington referred to as his folk opera that he worked on really for decades of his life off and on. He wrote the story, he wrote, and he writes songs, and he sort of changed them in and out. It was kind of a, a morphing sort of a story uh, uh, you know that that he worked on, and his uh, sort of dying wish that he expressed to uh, the woman who had been his partner for many years, his name is Betty McGettigan, was to see that uh, folk opera come to realization, and uh, so she kind of made that her business, and a few other a few entities uh, had sort of taken a stab at it. Actually, it was the uh, Butler Opera Center over at UT, put together through the generosity of Ernest and Sarah Butler, that, dis that acquired Queenie Pie with the idea that it would be a joint uh, UT opera, UT music, and also Houston Tillotson mm. University for uh, singers and dancers and costumes and things, and that was the idea. And so uh, UT acquired this, what was <laughs> thought to be the score that had been uh, done by somebody, and it turned out that the only thing that was there were the lead sheets that Duke Ellington had written. So it was just the song forms, the words, the melody line, chord changes. No part of it that's what we think of as Duke Ellington, the sound of the big band. None of that existed <laughs> other than maybe in Ellington's mind. So Jeff and I uh, divided it up and studied a lot of Ellington and uh, for certain things we could adapt and we put that together. You talked about there being pressure. I mean, there was nobody there to, we wanted it, if the pressure was from ourselves. We wanted, we wanted it to be as good as possible. Sure. And uh, so it was a very uh, gratifying eight night run o over at the uh, McCullough Theater on the UT campus. Again, a kind of combined cast of uh, UT music students with the UT Jazz Orchestra being the onstage backing band and uh, singers, dancers, costumes, other sort of directors from Houston Tillotson, and then a couple of guest stars in the uh, lead roles, which I think feeds back into a subject you'd like to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, before I, I jump onto that and kind of this, this beautiful, rich history of, of that collaboration you've had, uh, what was it like start to finish? What was the timeline there? How long were you and Jeff working on this? Well, it was sort of, I th we kind of had it uh, kind of over a Christmas break was kind of like when we really got, we saw what was there, we saw the lead sheets, we decided how to kind of split the labor between us, you know, who would take which songs. And then it seems like it was kind of 
that spring that the rehearsal started. So we didn't have a lot of turnaround sure. time. Yeah. And that, that record that is uh, out on the, the gloriously uh, benefiting musicians platform that we now know as Spotify, it's just amazing for <laughs> jazz musicians especially. Uh, yeah, you can quit your day job. Uh, you know, uh, uh, that is considered the definitive recording, is it not? Well, it was. Certainly, uh, Betty McGettigan thought it was because mm -hmm. she had seen some other, I won't name their n names and cities, but some rather illustrious opera companies that had supposedly taken it on and nothing had really happened. So sure. she was thrilled that, and she felt like that was the definitive. Finally, here it is. This start to finish, it was uh, uh, Duke's music and it was presented in the spirit of Ellington's orchestra rather than just being... Uh, maybe just a, a trio f faking some lead sheets, and you know it, it was given its due. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Well, you know, and the person who was I in that lead role, obviously, uh, of Queenie Five was uh, was Carmen Bradford uh, again. Who, yeah, can we have a hand for Carmen Bradford? I'm sure she's <laughs> listening to this stream. Um, you know, who was one of the last, if not the last, uh, vocalist to perform with uh, Basie, and so to to have somebody who had direct experience with Basie and then also to be performing in the lead role of this, uh, you know, completion of a Duke Ellington. I mean, that those are the two big titan names. We have the Basie ending and the Ellington ending that are just a stock endings for jazz musicians. So uh, anyways, having having Carmen and bringing her back in, was that your idea or was it just a happy circumstance? Well, you know, when we were thinking about who would do the lead role, I mean, Jeff and I immediately both thought of Carmen. She's just so perfect for it. And so uh, I can't remember if she was living in L.A. at that time or where she currently lives outside of Atlanta, but it was just, we didn't even have to discuss it. It was like, <laughs> who would be the lead role? Okay, Carmen. And then the Carmen. only question was maybe who would do the male role. So anyway, that, uh, but yeah, she was fantastic. And uh, it's, it's a bunch of great songs. And, you know, there, there, it was uh, just a beautiful production. Yeah, absolutely. So with Carmen, I mean, going back just a little bit in the history of, of yeah. how you guys uh, met and you were performing together, was Minor Miracle the group that you first collaborated on, or was it just one of them? It, uh, Minor Miracle already existed with another wonderful Austin uh, singer who le ended up singing with Leonard Cohen and people named Julie Christensen. She was the original uh, vocalist. Yeah, a lot of you know Julie. And she and and uh, singer Andy Murphy, who's also a fine recording engineer, was a singer. And at one point, I was introduced to Carmen through some studio work by Andy. Mm. And uh, uh, then then uh, the the size of the group was pared down for, uh, <laughs> it, of course, the economic realities. <laughs> and uh, and Carmen was singing, so I had the benefit of all those gigs working with Carmen and she was inspiring every single time and then you know one night you know she opened uh sang in front of the Count Basie Orchestra and uh Carmen has already sort of born royalty in jazz both yeah. uh, both her parents are very acclaimed jazz musicians and so she wasn't a total stranger to those sure. people those people knew about her and uh it was it, the, Carmen's big break ended up being the last night of that version of Minor Miracle, even though that yeah. wasn't the band. So we, we kind of moved on. But uh, I've worked with Carmen over the years in a number of different projects, writing arrangements for, playing with her live performances. Uh, did this uh, CD with her, uh, features her straight through, and you know continues to this day to be a dear friend and somebody I try to collaborate every opportunity. She's but she's right there in the middle of really all the greatest jazz yeah. musicians. I've, she worked for years with Butch Miles is out there. She worked with Butch for years, and so anyway, yeah, Carmen's one of a kind. Fantastic, and and that album, which is called Invisible Designs, as well as Flying Blind, which you have heard several compositions, including Half Past Sunday this evening, and then uh, also a third record, which what what it's something dreams, caffeine dreams, caffeine dreams. Yeah. Uh, you know, you've got the caffeine, I've got right. the, I've got the <laughs> bourbon, so uh, I need right. your assistance. Uh, but uh, those are all for those of you who are here in the audience. Those are available for purchase over at the bar, makeshift bar that we have over here.
And uh, for those of you who are tuning into the live stream and would like to grab a copy, you can go over to something that Michael Mordecai has been the father of, uh, Fable Records, uh, which is a, a record label that has featured so many prominent jazz musicians here in the Austin scene over the past five decades? Yeah, who's counting? Who's counting? <laughs> Not me. Not me, uh, which I believe that that website URL is fablerecords.biz, and it features so many amazing things, including another thing we'll talk about in just a little bit, Starcrossed, which featured uh, John's first ability to have a, a compositional platform back in 75. Uh, but for now, I want to hear some more of this band. Okay, we've got, can we do a couple tunes here, or what's your time frame? Let's see, we got 52, so let's do one more. Okay, and let's, then, guys, let's do the, uh, th that one that I misintroduced before. Let's do uh, Flying Blind right now, okay? Perfect. And then Flying Blind is the title track of uh, the CD that is available for sale. It's nothing if not a good plug. We got to make sure to get these guys as much as we can with uh, all these recorded works because guess what? When you support recorded works and you buy the CDs and they don't sit in the closet for three decades, that helps them make more. So support albums. Here's Flying Blind.
safe. <laughs> Did someone say one more song, guys? It's like, just hold out for one more song. You're batting like a 400. You know, like it's going to be just one more song. Amazing. Well, uh, John, man, one of the other things that, that we briefly mentioned in the last little segment before, uh, uh, before that last tune was that Fable Records has been, you know, kind of a formidable force in terms of, uh, you know, highlighting a lot of the most prolific and established Austin jazz musicians over the past, again, five decades. But again, who's counting? Um, you know, and I wanted to ask you about, um, I, understand, I understand that Starcross, that 75, 75 LP was your first compositional kind of foray of like very established. Yeah, that's right. And, and uh, Michael Mordecai, was, who's the head of Fable Records and uh, was, uh, you know, we collaborated really in the group Starcrossed. And it happens to be that uh, a member of the group Starcrossed, uh, our pian piano player David Deaton and our longtime sound man Rusty Buckner are both here in attendance right here in this very room. Thank you guys for showing up. We did not plan that. We did not plan that at all. Uh, fantastic. And I also read that uh, that 75 LP from Starcross was featured on BBC Radio, was stolen and sampled by a Detroit-based rapper. What, and an, what an honor to have your music stolen <laughs> by a rapper. <laughs> That's what I live for. Right. <laughs> Uh, and then was reissued in both Japan and the UK as recently as 2016. That's right. Wow. There were some good tracks on there. Yeah. Did you have any idea, star-crossed or otherwise, th of the lasting impact that that record label and that record itself would have? Well, of course not. That was our kind of our first time around the block, and you never would expect that or never even want to think about that. You're always just trying to do the best thing you can in the moment. But a great thing about, well, those days in Austin, that was the heyday of uh, Armadillo World Headquarters, which was mm. at the corner of Barton Springs Road and uh, South First, somewhere around there. And uh, it was a fantastic venue, not only for all the greatest up and coming uh, rock and roll acts, you know, people like on his way up, just making a name for himself, Bruce Springsteen would be there. You know, people like that, but that was sure. like the place. But uh, because of Hank Ulrich, who was uh, one of the owners anyway, and a great jazz fan, he would bring in wonderful uh, jazz acts uh, just for his own entertainment, really, mm. not that they would be big, uh, big ticket sellers. And a great thing about the Armadillo was no matter who the big act was, an Austin band would be the opening act, an appropriate Austin act. So yeah. of all the kinds of Austin music there were, there were there was that great stage opportunity in front of your heroes yeah. to be the opening act. That was, a, you know, we were so lucky. We knew we were lucky then, you know, we were in our, all in our 20s, and we didn't, we didn't, we never took that for granted. We knew that was a special opportunity, and I can't think of anything quite like that ever coming around again. That was at some very special times. Sure, yeah. Well, and another thing, too, I mean, obviously, you know, we can talk about Starcrest, but we can also talk about the band that is here today, and I'm sure a lot of people would be interested to know what was, and I'm going to steal an, uh, an SAT or GRE word from Colin Shook that he said the other day that I really enjoyed was, uh, what was the impetus or the motivation for uh, creating uh, John Mills Times 10? Well, it was a combination of elements. I mean, I've been writing a lot of music, period. I had specifically uh, uh, a late, great Bob Meyer, a wonderful musician we played with who was a fantastic trumpet player fantastic saxophone player, fantastic piano player, fantastic uh, arranger, composer. And he started a production company of, you know, of kind of published big band charts, but he was specializing uh, not just in full big band, but in a 10-piece band size. He was building a catalog. He had all kinds of stuff himself, but he invited some local writers, me included, to be in on that. So some of the very first things I wrote for a 10-piece band were for his publishing concept music publishing company. And that was some of the starting material. Uh, I had been, you know, and then uh, just through Michael Mordecai in an opening, uh, once a month opening at the Elephant Room, I just decided to uh, just jump in and convert a lot of 
music I'd written for different groups over the years, uh, school, like University of Texas Jazz Orchestra, or a group like the, the Creative Opportunity Orchestra, Tina Marsh's CO2. Mm -hmm. uh, I took music from a lot of different sources, and then I wrote music just specifically for Times 10, mm -hmm. and I just did it for uh, 10 pieces, and it, it was practically just from one month to the next. We had one rehearsal, uh, and we didn't play a single song all the way through. You know, we would play just the kind of the melody part and find the tempo. Go, okay, that's it. Next one, and that's as much as we knew going into our first gig. And everything since then has just sort of been built on people's uh, instincts and you know, adding new material and stuff. But we we jumped in before we were ready, which is a good thing because you know. Or else it would never happen. Sure, yeah. Well, I mean, the flexibility of the group to, to, to do that is, is certainly evidenced by um, the fact that last night was the first time that John Mills Times 10 has been back together in 15 months. And, right. and the band sounds like this. Yeah, Crazy. you know, it's, I mean, great players. And uh, I, I, I can't express enough to you gentlemen, uh, just, it, just the idea that you guys keep coming back for more punishment. That's, uh, <laughs> that's very encouraging. <laughs> Well, it, it, just asking now, you know, we, we talked the other day when we were filming this little promo for, for what was happening now, and, and you had said that you had been writing every single day of the pandemic, uh, and, and I'm curious if you feel naturally drawn after all this time writing for Times 10. Obviously, you write for so many different things, but if you feel that now there is a certain sentiment where you think more in terms of Times 10, or is it really just a toss-up every time you sit down? I, I do it a lot of times. I mean, I write for other directions as well. I mean, most of the music that you hear all came from one five-minute span or ten-minute span at the piano, where that's the music. And then there's the work of sort of uh, finalizing the arrangement and orchestrating it for all these players and laying it on paper. But the initial idea is something I do every day. And usually where I start with is, okay, we're at the elephant room, and some people are you know, coming down the stairs, what do I want them to hear? What sure. kind of what kind of what kind of groove is that? What kind of mood might that be? And that's usually where I start and just sort of improvise from there. Amazing. Well, uh, you know, we are nearing the end of the evening where we have about time for just a, a couple quick uh, closing statements and then one more tune from okay. the band. Uh, one thing that I want to make sure is just to acknowledge some people who have really made this thing happen. Um, I won't mention Tito's again, although, you know, I really want them to <laughs> want them to know, you know, that I have a soft spot uh, for them right in my heart. Uh, but a special acknowledgement to a few people um, as we embark upon this kind of second season of Off the Bandstand. Um, it, I've kind of told some people that have been here in the scene, uh, but a big announcement is that every episode of Off the Bandstand now, instead of being taking place over Zoom uh, in my apartment, will now be taking place here, courtesy of Colin Shook, in Monk's Jazz Club. All right. And we'll be doing a hybrid of different episodes where it's just, you know, the three of us here in the room or uh, might have some studio audiences. A couple of those things are being worked out right now, so we will have those announcements for you very soon. Uh, another thing is that uh, one of the things I hear about all the time is about how much of a bop the, uh, to use another one of those words, uh, a bop the opening title sequence of Off the Bandstand is, and that would certainly not be possible without the, uh, the wisdom and the creativity of what James Souter might refer to as a very talented boy, uh, a composer, arranger, pianist, Thomas Wayne Linsky, who just graduated from the University of Texas. <laughs> graduated hey, Thomas, from the... Yeah. And studied under a lot of these folks here and uh, is now at the University of Miami at uh, Frost School of Music. And another thing to announce is that uh, we haven't said this uh, publicly before, but John put today in his Facebook post that John Mills Times 10 was going to be the largest group that has been in this room. And I just thought, well, that, that just cannot do. I got to try to, you know, one up in my infinite wisdom of being 25 years old, one up John Mills. So on uh, Tuesday, July 27th, we are going to be mounting a brand new big band, uh, which is going to feature the uh, arrangements and compositions of Thomas Wanglinski, myself, David Mescatique, who is also in the house with us here tonight, uh, Stephen Feifke, Rich DeRosa, and a handful of other arrangers, Mike Sailors, uh, with an all-star big band, 17 people. 
pieces. It's going to be the Christian Wigs big band melding together original tunes, standards, and contemporary tunes reformatted in the... Uh, well, in the jazz big band idiom. So we are very excited to announce that. Keep an eye out for the tickets. We'll be announcing that very soon. And then uh, last, I just, uh, oh, one more thing, is that this logo, which I am obsessed with, was created by a guy who I went to high school with. We were in marching band together. He played euphonium. I played trumpet. And uh, we have reconnected over the years. His name is Steven Swirsky. He now works for, uh, let me make sure I got this right, Powerhouse Animation, who is responsible for the anime show Castlevania on Netflix, if you are familiar with Castlevania. So the new Off the Bandstand logo is courtesy of Steven Swirsky. I'm so, so, so incredibly happy. I, I feel like a kid in a candy store every time I get to collaborate with people like John, Steven, Thomas, Colin, everybody in this room. It is just, I'm filled with gratitude and, and I could not be, you know, if I talk any more about it, I'm going to get emotional. So I'm going to move on. Uh, but, uh, and then the last thing is that, uh, you know, the man who has made the magic happen this past year through these immersive live stream concerts, um, working hours where he sleeps up here and he gets two hours of sleep and he puts on these amazing eight camera productions for the past year, keeping the glue of the Austin scene together. Please, please put your hands together for Colin Shook. He looked at me uh, whenever we, I brought in these chairs yesterday and we started getting the setup and positioning the tables and he's like, are we about to have like a late night talk show here in Monks? And I was like, yeah, it's gonna be sick. It's gonna be amazing. So again, uh, the last thing, the way we end every single episode of Off the Bandstand, and it's so fun, there is really, truly run the gamut, is that we all have gigs from hell where things go up the wall and we just cannot believe what is happening before our eyes. John Mills, after 50 years of Austin and elsewhere, can you recall a time that was a gig from hell? Well, there was a recent one where I was uh, hired to play Barry Sachs on an outdoor gig in San Antonio. It was kind of winter, so it was a chilly evening. And as luck had it, I had just put my Barry Sachs in the shop, so I didn't have access to it. But by a stroke of luck, I had just bought a, uh, a backup berry that I'd never, I tried it out and it sounded you know, really good in the room and I thought, hey, I've got this horn, this is the perfect, what, I'm prepared. So I showed up for the gig with my trusty, or not trusty, new berry. And you know, it, just the usual, you know, meeting and greeting with fellow members of the band. And you know, it was about 60 seconds before downbeat and um, and I played a note on my baritone sax, and I was like a quarter tone flat. I mean, just where you couldn't possibly play a right note. You know, there's just no fixing it. So I, you know, I pushed the mouthpiece in further and tried, still horribly flat, pushed it in a little further, still wasn't going to work. It was about 15 seconds till downbeat. I pushed it one last push, and the neck just snapped off. The neck didn't come out, you know, it snapped off the metal, just broke right inside the tube. And, <laughs> and, and the late, great Morgan King was right next to me, and he just kind of gave me a deadpan look like, oh, I wonder what's going to happen now, this should be interesting. So I had a slot, like about a, a dime's thickness, where I could place, you know, the, the, there was nothing to fit the thing in, but I could kind of place my neck on the berry, and wow, I could play some notes. I was functional. And okay, so far I just sort of, you know, just keep it balanced there, and I could kind of play, I could play my parts. But as soon as I got offered a solo, uh, you know, the first, I thought, okay, I could take a solo on, you know, A Train or whatever it was. And I played about, but, uh, but you know, and then just the motion of my head because you can't control it. You're, you get emotionally attached when you play a solo. You can't be still. And the, uh, you know, I was left 
holding a saxophone with the neck and the mouthpiece sticking out, you know, it was just, and uh, I know Michael Mordecai and maybe Eric, I don't know who was there, but leading the laughing section when that happened. I mean, it was hilarious. Sometimes those things are so miserable, it's like, man, it's going to be a long time before this is funny. It was funny then, right, as it happened. And um, so over the course of the night, I could keep it together playing my parts, but then the, the other guys would egg, egg, it on, egg it on for me to try another solo because they wanted to see that happen again. You know, and I, was, I always felt like, okay, well, I can do this. You know, I'll just, I know what the problem is, so I'll just keep very still and just play. It doesn't have to be a great solo, just a reasonable solo, and I'd get about four beats into it, and it would happen again. And, it ha you know... <laughs> I never totally wised up. I probably tried it about four times that evening. With I never got any further than uh, two seconds. It was like the guy trying to ride the bucking bronco and doesn't even last, you know, point two seconds. It was a total total failure every time. So that was a long night. Absolutely incredible, ladies and gentlemen, John Mills. All right. Again, again, we do have right up top, uh, for those of you here in the audience tonight who would love to tip the band, and for those of you who are watching at home, uh, there is a Venmo and a PayPal right above my head, uh, and then also the link to my website, christianwigs.com, where you can keep up with every episode of Off the Bandstand going forward, and the catalog of 49 beforehand. Uh, so... Anyways, let's go ahead with the last tune. John, what do you have for us? We're going to do uh, Used to Be Blue. Let's if we get to the solos. Let's have Jake take the first one and Russ take the second one. Used to Be Blue, okay?
John Mills times 10. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up. Give it up for John Mills and times 10. Colin Shook, ladies and gentlemen. Have a great night. Please drive safe and uh, check out the future episodes of Off the Bandstand featuring episode 51, Andre Hayward, soon to come. Yeah.